Outback Stories. Outback Stories celebrates the pioneering spirit of Australia. It makes little difference if your family came on the first fleet or on a leaky boat last week. Our unique national identity was born and bred in the outback. These are your stories. The Australian Outback was brought together by the rattle and roll of the wheels of the Cobb & Co coaches. Drawn by teams of mighty sweating horses, under the crack of the whip of legendary coach drivers who controlled the reins, or ribbons as they were called, the coaches crisscrossed the country delivering passengers, the Royal Mail, and all manner of supplies from sewing machines to boots. The arrival of the Cobb & Co coach typically created excitement. Returning family, visitors, workers, newspapers, letters and parcel deliveries. It was a standing joke in many small country towns that a census could be taken at the post office not long after the coach's arrival. Cobb & Co was established by a consortium of young Americans led by a 23-year-old Freeman Cobb. It was so successful on the Victorian goldfields that two years later they sold it for a tidy sum. The company changed hands several times and, because of the sheer size of Australia, competitive coach services were established. Their combined horse tracks paved the way for the railways and townships. One of the most successful names in the story of Australian coaching, and indeed Cobb and Co, is James Nicholas, who rose from gate opener and stable groom to one of the leading owners of the famous brand. I went to work for Cobb & Co at Wagga Wagga in the early 1870s. I was just a lad in the big coaching stables there. My father had been one of the many successful mining speculators in the early days of Victoria. However, after we relocated to New South Wales, he lost his health and fortune and never regained either. So for me, it was a case of going to work. My father was a good horseman and he had taught my brother and me to ride and drive the coaches pretty well. So I naturally turned to Cobb & Co for a living. Of course I began at the bottom of the ladder and filled all the different occupations connected with coaching, including opening and closing the gates of properties the coach passed through. Later, from age 15, I drove for Cobb & Co out of Wagga Wagga for 10 years. I left the company in 1884 to drive coaches out of South Australia on the Wilcannia to Tarauri run. But a year later, along with another driver, we started our own mail contract coach service. It was successful, and in 1887, two of the Kidman brothers, Sackville and Sydney, bought my partner out to hold the other 
and the rest, as they say, is history. We traded as Kidman and Nicholas, and our operations ran into all states except Victoria, but much the biggest in New South Wales and Western Australia. James Nicholas progressed from stable hand to driver, agent, manager, part owner, and finally co-owner of Cobb & Co out of West Australia. He was continuously connected with some branch or other of the coaching business for over half a century. Jimmy as he was usually known, was a crack horseman, coach rider and enterprising businessman. By the 1880s, the colony of West Australia was booming. Nicholas was expanding his coach business and his partnership with the Kidman brothers proved successful. With Nicholas negotiating the mail contracts and managing the coach services, while the Kidmans handled the all-important horse supply. With the discovery of gold at Coolgardie in 1892, the West really was the Wild West, and Cobb and Co emerged as a vital part of its inland transport and communication. Jimmy Nicholas was fond of Australian bush poetry and never travelled without a collection of old verses. He would have enjoyed the popular drinking toast of the 1890s, which offered Damn Coolgardie, damn the track, damn it there and damn it back, damn the country, damn the weather, damn the goldfields altogether. The Kidman and Nicholas Cobb and Co, eight-horse teams and high-wheeled coaches continually moved prospectors and supplies from gold rush to gold rush. The supply of good horses was vital to the success of the business, and no one knew more about horses than Sidney Kidman. He realised wild horses could be easily trained within a day or two and once harnessed the harder they bolted the better the coach drivers liked it the trick he said was to have a good solid leader horse the other important factor was water and feed for the stock sid kidman knew about both at one stage in 1908, the coach service looked like it was about to fold. There was a severe drought. And then Nicholas and Kidman came across the idea of using camels and they purchased 500 camels, raised a few eyebrows, but they managed to get the mail through. The men on the driver's seat of Cobb and Co's coaches reputedly feared nothing. They battled wet weather, which turned tracks into boggy sludge, blinding dust storms where vision was restricted to a few yards, and millions of flies intent on driving both man and horse mad. In the early days, bush rangers regularly bailed up the gold escort coaches. Yet, against all adversity, the Cobb & Co coaches kept tightly to their timetable. Interestingly, whilst bail-ups were common in the eastern colonies, Cobb & Co WA never experienced a single bush ranging attack. Night travel was usually fraught with extra danger and discomfort. Sitting on the exposed box seat of a coach was bitterly cold. In winter, the cold was almost unbearable, 
It was a marvel how the drivers endured it night after night. Their feet suffered the most from the numbing cold, and various devices were adopted by the drivers to prevent this. Some kept their feet in a box of chaff, whilst others were credited with carrying a woolly dog to rest their feet upon. For passengers, it was far from romantic. Sweat-covered horses, breathing heavily as they plodded along narrow, unmade tracks, clouds of choking dust, and the creaking and groaning of the cumbrous and travel-stained coach as it lurched forward on its journey. Crowded to an uncomfortable degree, a trip by coach in the early days was anything but an enviable one. Yet it was the main form of transport used, and there were few complaints. One of the best-known Cobb & Co coaches was Leviathan. It carried up to 89 passengers and was generally associated with the legendary whip, Ned Cabbage Tree Divine. This monster coach, built in Ballarat in 1860, was usually drawn by 16 horses, with Cabbage Tree Ned as the driver. One of its main runs was in transporting shearers in western New South Wales. It wasn't unusual for it to travel from Hay to Daniloquin with a cargo of 50 to 70 burly shearers and roustabouts. Ned's fame included transporting Stevenson's first English 11 cricket team in 1862 from Melbourne to Geelong behind 12 white horses and, six years later, he was deputed to carry, as his distinguished passenger, the Duke of Edinburgh. Years later, Jimmy Nicholas purchased Leviathan more out of sentiment than practicality because its wheel width wasn't the right one for the West Australian tracks. Its last journey was to transport 150 school kids from Wagga Wagga to Hay for a school picnic. It was said Cobb & Co had three classes of passenger. Whenever a coach came to a boggy patch or a steep hill, the drivers used to shout, First class, keep your seats. Second class, get out and walk. Third class, get out and push. James Nicholas never lost his enthusiasm for the outback or coaching. He revelled in developing coach services, beating the competition on mail contracts and, even with the advent of motor cars, was quick to embrace a new approach. Cobb and Co. Motor Coaches. Reminiscing in 1925, Jimmy Nicholas recalled, The first time I saw a motor car out back was at Laverton. The car got along so well that I could see the quick demise of all other methods of carrying traffic. So I at once began cutting big coaches down and making them into vans and selling them at about half their original value. I also disposed of horses and other coaching equipment as soon as possible and began carrying on the business of Cobb & Co with motor cars instead of old coaches. I could see the days of Cobb & Co were finished and the sooner I drifted into some other line of business the better. I realised all my life's studies and education in coaching had gone in one swoop. In 1914, James Nicholas bought Dirk Hartog Island and took to running sheep on his rural properties. 
He died in 1929, four years after the lights of Cobb Co. had finally been extinguished, with the last Cobb Co. coach run in 1924. Henry Lawson's green sweeps of horizons blue were crossed by more efficient and comfortable, if less romantic, means of transport. <laughs>